Welcome, builders, to another episode of How Would You Build It? It's now episode 71. Renia, we're reaching that 100 mark. Feels like it's getting a close. How are you doing this afternoon? Yeah, great. Thanks, Bobby. Lucky to be here. I can't believe we've got another South African from San Francisco. How does this keep happening? I know. There's some great stories out there. Louis, calling in, late, bragging from San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing this evening? Uh, I'm very well, thanks. My morning. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Very well, thanks, Bobby and Renee. Great to be here. I'm lovely to chat to you guys. I haven't been here that long though, so I can't say um, I don't know what you call a San Franciscan. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get hung up on my toes for saying that. I don't know what the lingo is yet, but as, l- as long cool. as you still support the Springboks, then uh, and and Rickers, then we're fine. I wake up at the most weird hours to watch the box. Fortunately, the Americans love the USC so much, so. I never have to worry about weird times for the USC. So I can go watch an too. Irish pub, no problem. But when the box nice. play, no, no one here really cares. <laughs> when, <laughs> triggers, or when the UFC is on, then everyone does it. It's, it's been interesting to see how everyone's like, who's that big guy next to him? That's urban people. You should know him by now. <laughs> All the Americans are like, that guy's huge. Until they see the atheist man. Anyways, yeah. we're digressing. Welcome, builders, to How Would You Build It? The podcast that dives deep into the dynamic world of startups and product creation right here in South Africa and Africa. This show is more than just interviews. Every week we sit down with the brilliant minds to provide a masterclass for building digital products amidst the challenges and opportunities unique to our continent. From seasoned founders to dynamic product managers, we uncover the unique stories and strategies behind some of the most innovative digital products being built. So for all the aspiring founders and product builders out there, you'll discover that each episode is a wealth of practical wisdom and local and actionable insights. Make sure to subscribe or follow wherever you listen to our podcasts and connect with us on social media for even more content. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Um, Louis, uh, if you can just give us for our listeners, our community and our audience booked, can you tell us what you guys do, what problem you're solving and how did you land up in San Francisco? Oh, geez, the story could be two minutes long. It could be 38 minutes long. I'll try and give the concise version. Um, the company has been going for probably about three years in various shapes and forms. You guys have obviously spoken to a lot of founders, so you know the journey has got its ups and downs, lefts and rights, and there's several pivots throughout. So the whole concept started to certify the knowledge you gain from reading. Um, I was a big, I studied a lot in different degrees, and so quite a lot of experience in traditional education. Not a big fan of traditional education, but I think the university system has failed on more than one front or actually lagged behind, should I rather say. So the whole company was started out of this notion that nonfiction books provide you with such a phenomenal form of education, yet it's not, you know, it's not tangible. You can't show someone you've gained that knowledge. So that's where books started. Was Let's actually do, let's certify that knowledge. Let's do for non, do nonfiction books what you did to video. Um, a very wild first I'll call it six to nine months, but ended up working in the B2B space, helping corporates actually build reading cultures inside their teams. After that, focus on B2B, we raised a round, built out, worked in corporates, built out the team, got quite a lot of traction, and that kind of led to where we are today. And I think the best way for me to describe book is essentially saying we are an AI-powered social reading app. That's probably the simplest way to to kind of put it, where we get communities, uh, where the global communities or, or kind of isolated communities, just groups of people reading nonfiction books together. And we've obviously, you know, built the application on the foundation of AI. So it's kind of a, a fully augmented reading experience where we're not just reading the book, you're gaining so much value over and above the book from the AI bringing YouTube videos and helping you understand concepts inside the book a bit better. And then actually just com- connecting you to the broader community. You know, kind of mm-hmm. showing you, hey, these guys have similar interests, kind of making that connection, letting you run with it. So we're very focused on helping someone build a reading habit and actually use reading as a form of education. Because, I mean, it's probably one of the best forms of education. When you read a top-selling nonfiction book, then guys be through the ringer. They, mm-hmm. they know what they're talking about. They, they love the experience. So it's, it's kind of a, a validated form of learning, which is mm-hmm. really cool. I love, I mean, my bookshelf has grown over the years. I can definitely attest to it, the amount that I've learned by reading those books. Sorry, Renee. Hey there, coffee lovers and crypto explorers. 
Are you looking for the perfect brew to start your day and fuel those crypto discussions? Well, let me introduce you to Crypto Coffee. Their medium roast Arabica beans offer a taste that's out of this world. It's the ideal blend to wake you up and keep you going through all your crypto adventures. Plus, Crypto Coffee makes a fantastic gift for that friend who can't stop talking about the latest blockchain trends and needs a little extra energy to keep the conversation going. So why not grab a bag today and enjoy a cup that's as rich and as exciting as your crypto journey. Crypto Coffee, where every sip feels your passion for crypto. Yeah, no, so, so Louis, practically, I mean, it sounds awesome, but I mean, practically, if you use it, so, so let, me, let me see if I understand this right. So you, you take 0 to 1 from Peter Thiel and you break it down for me into the most important things I should get from this book, right? And then based on that, AI can either help me answer questions that I have on that or engage further in terms of how to make some of those things practical. Is that right? To an extent. So we very much veer away from altering the actual book. So we do work with, and we are part of all the big global publishers. So we have access to all of those eBooks, hundreds of thousands of eBooks. So we don't alter the actual book. We are, funny enough, this is a complete side topic. We are looking to work with one of the big publishers to actually train models on the contents of their catalog to actually start altering the books. But anyway, that's a completely different story. The point is that book zero to one, you would kind of sign up to books. You would read that on the application, the full book. What we've done is broken it up into little bites, but not altered the actual book. And the whole idea is just to get you to read a little bit, but every single day. So it's kind of gamifying bite-sized reading, if you will. And then... Throughout that journey, imagine while you're reading the book on your phone, you can see the notes people in your community or people around the world are making on this book, notes relevant to you. That's cool. Over and above, over and above that, you've got AI inside that actual reader. You can speak to it. It knows what book you're reading. Where you make a note while you read, it'll respond to your note, giving real life examples, showing you how else you can think about it. As a matter of fact, it even brings in YouTube videos. So it'll bring in TED Talks based on critical thinking. If you made a note on first principles thinking, for example. So uh, mm. yeah, the AI is there to kind of bolster the experience and just draw in more outside content relevant to what you're reading into the experience. And then you read the full book with either a group of people or kind of everyone around the world. So think of it like okay. a subreddit for books, if you will. Um, mm. everyone's part of the subreddit, everyone's reading together and the AI helps match the right people together. Builds like a dynamic book club. So you don't have to go look for a book club. We'll build one around you. Yeah. And then, and then how do you make money? Like how do you charge or do you sell the books? Do you sell a subscription? No. So we don't, uh, we don't do the subscription model for a couple of reasons. I'd love to say the primary reason is because people are moving away from the concept of subscription models, which I do think to an extent is true, but truth be told, we obviously work with the publishers. So mm. it's very difficult uh, to kind of go down the subscription model route because they're just not a big fan of it. You can see in Kindle Unlimited, all of these other services, they never yeah. have access to the full catalog. So the publishers prefer it and it actually works to our favor, a simple retail model. So you would right. go to exclusive books, and buy there is one for two three hundred grand. Just we say rather count to book, spend that same money once or mm. and you get access to this global community and the AI to do this. Okay. And then breaking it down, I mean like how 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 do you break it down? Like how do you get me to how do you get everybody listening to this to read Zero to One? Because they should. It's a really good book. I would say don't even stop at zero to one. There's so much stuff an entrepreneur should read, it's not even funny. But Look, I think the idea for us, and this is maybe part of, part of a broader conversation around trying to create readers versus going to people who already read. So it's kind of, and this is some hard lessons I've learned. It's kind of trying to hit the blue ocean, getting people that don't read, turning them into readers, or alternatively, simply going to the entrepreneurs who are already reading and saying, look, we simply have a better solution for you. Mm. So we spent a lot of time trying to kind of create new readers and really get people to build that reading habit. And we've had a lot of success with it and that's fantastic, but it does nonetheless provide a lot of friction, a lot of obstacles. So we are now also saying, look, instead of, you know, just trying to create brand new readers from scratch, let's actually focus on finding the people who are reading zero to one, who do want to read anyway, 
mm-hmm. and just put a dentist solution in front of them. So mm-hmm. it's not so much about, you know, turning someone that doesn't want to read into a reader. Um, that is a longer term ideal goal, but for the short term, it's actually just finding the people who are already reading and presenting them with a better solution. Okay. So you, you mentioned earlier about B2C, B2B, you work for B2B. Can someone on the side of the road sign up? How does it work? Does it need to go through a company? Like what's the, the business model in terms of who can actually sign up and start going down your journey? This is obviously a lot of the, the, the stuff I've kind of learned over the last while. So yes, we have been in B2C and B2C. So I've kind of got the scars to show for both, both business models, if you will. So at this stage, we are most of our uh, resources are kind of deployed to the B2B or currently we're working very much in the B2B space. We do work with a lot of your top corporates, PPS, AFSA, all of these guys kind of use booked and it's deployed in the organization, traditionally in the leadership groups to kind of get, you know, the reading leadership together, et cetera. But um, with regards to the B2C, a big thing we realized, and this is actually something that, that kind of hit me while I was in San Francisco, is that I'm speaking to all of these entrepreneurs. All of these guys are really just looking for resources to give them an edge. And one of the biggest resources is actually finding other entrepreneurs that share similar interests that want to learn just as much as they do. It's kind of like this fertile ground of knowledge. And we realized the massive opportunity in just kind of helping entrepreneurs, not only bringing in the knowledge they need or the knowledge they're looking for, but actually bringing in the, the group that they can actually participate in. So I, I don't want to uh, take too long of a road in this explanation. Basically, what it comes down to is we do ha- uh, work B2B, so we do work with all the corporates. And we've literally mm. just opened all of the B2C arm, but we're not opening our full catalog. Uh, our whole idea and our whole concept is to help specifically entrepreneurs. And we want to build dense communities around the top entrepreneurship books. So we invite all entrepreneurs, everyone looking to start a startup currently, busy with a startup, to come out to book and join one of our global reading communities. Um, and they'll get plugged straight into a massive group of other entrepreneurs reading the same book, but also kind of on that same journey. So someone on the side of the road can just go to the book side join one of the global communities and they'll be slot in or they'll kind of join that global group readings together. That's very cool. And why only entrepreneurs? Because if you think about uh, product management, the, the field that I'm in, I mean, there's also so much reading that one should be doing in that field because it's not something you necessarily can go and study. It's actually reading books and getting some experience. Why are you focusing purely on entrepreneurship? Are you planning on expanding that? Can you just, what's the strategy there? Yes. You guys, give me a second. I, I may be the weirdest podcast guest. I just had to move. I don't know if you can even see me. I can't even see myself <laughs> when I look at that little square. Touch, touch by an angel, the old, the uh, <laughs> old SABC2 show. <laughs> to your question, Bobby, um, we. Hey, I, I, I want to say the only reason is because, you know, that's my world. I work with entrepreneurs and I want to help entrepreneurs. And that is largely the reason. But a different reason very much is more around the business model. It's actually around the growth model of the company. Now, if you're building social communities or groups of people, you have uh, the cold start problem in front of you. And you need to kind of overcome that cold start problem if you really want to build a sustainable company that can have an impact. Facebook's just an incredible example of a company that successfully managed to solve a cold start problem. And that's what it comes down to is we need to build dense reading communities. And it is very difficult to do that across a distributed catalog. This is actually a large part of my learnings around how to look at your market. And this is a thing I think more entrepreneurs should actually spend time on is looking at their competitors in their market. But someone like Amazon, You know, if you look at all the reading apps that have come before us, every single one of them have tried to compete against Amazon on catalog size. Now, every single one of them, for the most part, have kind of failed. And what's really a mind bender when it comes to this reading market is, if you really think about it, the application itself is not the product. The application is simply the delivery vehicle for the product. The book is the product. So if you've got a massive catalog, you're selling all of these different products, all of these different markets. It's very difficult to build dense or get a foothold in one of the markets. 
And so Amazon just kind of waits you up, right? They're just like, okay, this company's raised $10 million. We'll just give it three years. Um, and then they just try and compete to catalog size. So what we're doing, we're kind of flipping it on his head and saying, look, ooh, you know, we're never going to be able to compete against them on catalog size. And we don't even really want to. What we want to compete is in the overall reading experience. And we fundamentally see the social side of the application mm. as a core experience to the reading mm. process. And for us to execute well on the social side, we need to solve the cold start problem. We need to build dense communities and you need to get that word of mouth growth. So that is kind of why we're focusing on entrepreneurs because it's a very, that first of all, fantastic market to work with, especially if you have domain expertise. But yeah, it's, mm. um, it's from a domain expertise point of view, but also everything I just said about solving the cold stars and how to kind of, how we looked at our markets and approach, approached it. Mm. So, so Louis, on that, I, I spoke to a South African founder recently and I thought what they said was super meaningful. And I actually want to pose the question to you as to if you've considered it or, or why you're not doing it. Um, they said like, you know, specifically in South Africa, we've got this, we've got this problem that we've got these massive incumbents, right? Like these corporates are enormous, right? So you want to, you want to build something. They're just so big. It's like, you really can't compete with them, right? At least not when you start out. So what they said is, you know, if you look at the value chain and what the corporate's offering, if you can find a little pain point in there that can kind of go in the wings of the incumbents, so you go, cool, these guys are doing X, but but I just have this little add-on and I'm building awesome integrations into everything they're doing, you know, and, and, and now I can land a few customers there. And as you grow, now you eventually could get enough critical mass to actually then eventually take on the, the, uh, the, the big player. Uh, I mean, in, in light of that, I think, you know, running, maybe offering Amazon to, you know, or people to access their Amazon books in your platform could be interesting because you're building something that Amazon never would build. They would never focus on the reading experience. They're focusing on scale, catalog, distribution. They're distribution business, really. I mean, they're not in the business of, of consumption as much as distribution. So, so I mean, have you thought about that? Is that so, or, or what do you think about that idea? Like, do you think it's something that can work? Uh, well, no, as far, as far as I know, no startup has ever failed by niching down too much. Yeah. Many startups have failed by trying to go too broad too quickly. So, you know, we're actually a very good example of what you just explained. You know, South African startups are looking at corporates, the incumbents, the big guys that own the value chain. First of all, they always have weaknesses throughout that entire value chain, but yeah. nonetheless, I mean. We are a prime example of that exact thing. Amazon is one of the most ridiculous monopolies on the book market um, yeah. that kind of ever has existed. So that's the corporate of corporates. Owning there's, obviously there's, there's, one, there's one bigger, Google owning search. They're here. And as a matter of fact, that's probably going to be broken up now. So and, and, they, and SpaceX yeah, owning rockets. There's, there's the three big ones. To be fair, though, I think SpaceX owning rockets wasn't monopoly. At the end, you know, there was no monopolistic politics going on there. I think that's just the better. No one can actually just it's just the better rocket. Whereas with Google, well, rocket, if, know, if, 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 if you if you if you better early enough for a long period of time, then you capture that market. Yeah, I mean the Google example is a good one. Like they obviously they had a monopoly on search. That's undoubtedly the truth. And they the the dear whole um. I think Lena Khan, no, it won't be her, but they're stepping in now to kind of sort that out, to try and sort out Google's monopoly. But the, the thing is, Google obtained that monopoly through just simply having a better product. Now, they yeah. may have, they got to that point by having a better product. Now, they may have paid up 20 billion and all of that stuff to kind of keep the monopoly to an extent. But, you know, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, so I, I think what it comes down to is Google never really, for me, did anything nefarious to get and maintain the monopoly. They just simply had a better product for such mm -hmm. a long period of time that it seeped in everywhere. They were just yeah. clever enough to understand, you know, where to kind of play. But maybe just back to Amazon and, and kind of these big corporates. So and the analogy I like to use is Amazon's got this massive wall, which is kind of represents their full catalog. Now, instead of us trying to kind of hit that wall from the front, what we're doing is we're just going to remove one brick, which represents a book at a time uh, mm. and you know we can sustainably take even a small margin of sales from their top 10 business books we're causing them a problem because mm. 
we're actually sustainably taking sales out of that category. And that's kind of taking one brick out of that wall at a time. And that's how I like to look at it. If you do that for a long enough period of time, you've opened up a hole in that wall. And I think that comes down to a lot of these big corporates is they've got these walls, but there are weak, weak points in these walls. But you just need to kind of focus on finding the brick and just removing that brick. And it's going to look different for everyone. Um, but there is always a, there's always a way to do it. It just sometimes it requires more research. Just to give you guys kind of an idea of how I think about market or, or the state to which you need to understand your market. And as hit me over the head like a baseball bat when I arrived in San Francisco, I went so far as to go follow every single reading app that's come before us, follow their founders on social medias, and actually go stalk them and look to back or, or go back to when they were running the companies. What were they tweeting? What were they interacting with their people? All of that actually just kind of gave me an insight into where they struggled against someone like Amazon, where, you know, they hit that wall and they tried it wrong. And you, there's always a common thread or a theme you can see. And then I just reached out to them and spoke to them and asked them, guys, this is how I'm looking at doing it. What do you think? And they all said, yep, they wish they did this sooner. So I would implore more startups to kind of, people have come before you. Whether you want to admit it or not, you are not the only company doing what you're doing. In some way, shape, or form, someone else is doing it or has tried to do it. Just go understand where they came out short. Just go do, do the research. Go follow the founders. Reach out to the uh, ex-founders. You'll be surprised how often they'll just be like, yep, that's, that was a difficult time. This is, and, this, and this is what we learned. This is what we would have done different. I mean, what better knowledge can you ask? So... So, so Louis, on that point, I, I love that, Lou, and I actually want to emphasize it and share a personal story. Like, I mean, we, we're still figuring out how to build a, a modern media company, right? And in the open letter, because that's, that's pretty much what it is. It's a modern tech media company. Yeah. And, um, you know, part of that is community and other stuff. And Matthew Marston from Startup Club, he's not building a media company, but he's also building stuff in the startup space, working with sponsored partners, et cetera. I literally phoned him two days ago, and him and I had a half an hour chat. And he shared like so much, like, this is how I put the pro proposal together. This is how we package it. This is the value. I mean, he, he, started, he stopped short of actually giving me his playbook of exactly what he's doing. And it's because Matthew also understands it's all about execution, right? And he's also like, you know, if we win, he wins, everybody wins, the, the tide rises. So I think it's a problem in South Africa. Why do you think South Africans don't do that? Why do they not reach out and ask people? Uh, so before I answer that, just one, like Paul Graham actually says, this is so true. A competitive, you know, startup failure is almost never as a result of competition. Usually it's a result of something yeah. else. The odds of a startup failing because of, comp because of competition is so extremely low, you can almost discount it. So it's kind of just, I mean, I was in the same boat, especially from South Africa, because you think the idea is so valuable. Your first thought is, I'm going to go get an NDA and make it right, sign this before I even tell them. First of all, very few people actually care enough to even pay that much attention. But secondly, those that do really understand how difficult it is to actually do this. Everyone has their own stuff going on. And you and Matthew winning is a positive sum game. Matthew, mm. If you guys win, Matthew's simply going to win even more. So it's very mm -hmm. good for the ecosystem. The ecosystem needs to be lifted up as a whole. Mm -hmm. And a, a big thing I've come to realize, and you know, I love South Africa and I very much want the tech scene there to thrive. And I just don't think what works here will necessarily work there. The market conditions are just not the same. So we mm -hmm. can't actually just try and copy paste San Francisco, but we can still learn from San Francisco. And what they've done sure. was build a fertile bed and if success, or actually, as a matter of fact, how I look at it, in San Francisco, failure is the expectation. That's a very weird thing to say, but they expect you to try as much stuff, speak to as many people, and fail as much as you possibly can. Whereas in South Africa, failure is very taboo. Like you really can't afford to fail. You'll be, you know, it's a bad thing. You know, there's so many reasons for that. And I think that's, that's one of the big differences and why I think South Africans are hesitant to kind of reach out to someone and speak is, Maybe one of the reasons is it's that fear of failure in the sense of if I give my idea or my idea away, they could outcompete me. That will result mm. in my failure. But those three things very rarely actually even. First of all, they're not really going to do that much with what 
in the information you've given in a sense that it could actually negatively affect you. Um, so the reason for reaching out and asking people being open about what you're doing is not going to lead to your failure. And um, I think it's just understanding that aspect. And if you are put, one of the, and this is actually something I, I've written about recently, one of the best investments I think a South African tech startup can make is to send one of their founders to San Francisco just for a month. Uh, you, you know, whether you build a year or not, doesn't matter. Just, just come here and just see what's going on. Go back and you'll quickly realize you'll see you can't necessarily transpose what's happened working here to there, but it really will open your mind in terms of being open about talking what you're doing, getting feedback from people, speaking to them about it, bouncing ideas off of them. Um, because yeah, it happens all the time. So it's the norm for people to speak to one another about what they're building. In South Africa, it's not. So it's kind of just the environment, I think, that or the ecosystem hasn't quite developed to the point where we've had enough successes where people actually realize that speaking about what you're doing actually leads to more success. So I hope over time that that will change and we are more comfortable to speak to one another about what it is we're building. And I mean, I'm now very open. I've told, mm. I've spoken to three of our quote unquote competitors. I've given them the whole playbook just because mm. it's very interesting for me to see how they react to it, what they say. And very often you'll see they'll just open up and be like, oh man, we tried this, that didn't work. We actually looked at it this way, et cetera. Um, because it's not really you competing against them. It's kind of you competing against yourself to an extent. So I think it's just kind of understanding that. And yeah, so I, I think it's probably a nice you could say on that topic. It's a very, very nuanced and difficult to answer. But I think it's just this display of the relevant ecosystems development. I think San Francisco mm -hmm. just a little bit further, which has unlocked a lot of mm -hmm. different things uh, that, that happen in a different ways. I think, I think also, I mean, if I, if I can get all South Africans a bit uncomfortable, I think there's a way in South Africa, and, and there's a lot of different ways, by the way, I'm not pointing to one way, to, to win without actually executing better, faster, smarter, right? And, and that has created a culture where people don't want to talk about the ideas because someone else... They think someone else might actually execute better than them. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think this, this great reset is necessary. And, and I mean, I'm, like, I'm not pointing to some specific thing. There's actually a lot of stuff like, um, you know, having relationships with, you know, key corporates through family connections or, you know, through whatever. Like, uh, there's, there's so many of those things that have been coming along for years. And people have this. I also think people have this fear of the pies getting smaller in South Africa. Uh, but now I think with the new government, uh, where, I mean, you just look at the rand being super bullish against the dollar as opposed to other currencies globally. Um, you know, we look at Drikas winning, we look at the Springboks winning, we look at all the Olympics, we're just winning everywhere. So <laughs> I'm, I'm but, hopeful but, but maybe, Renier, maybe perhaps the stuff's going to change. But Renew, something that I'm picking up and I know that, uh, your time at Specno and whatnot, you, you what's the word, exposed to a lot of corporates. From what I'm picking up, the corporates are just not doing a good job of being innovative. And that's why I'm like, please get them to read more books, Louis. Because they, yeah, so, so, or go do the, the networking because they're not executing very well. Well, these well let, let, let me make a comment and then I'd love to hear from Louis how he actually got corporates to be interested in any kind of innovation that doesn't come from mm -hmm. within. Um, I, I think the biggest problem with corporates is not the innovation programs or the ability to innovate. But it's the complete reluctance to engage the broader innovation ecosystem at the kind of scale which would actually help them. Like they, they just ignore everything unless they know someone through something. Um, and it's like they, 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 and I, and I get it. All of them are busy. They're doing stuff. You know, it's, it's all happening. But, but the reality is, if they can, if they can, stupid phone. Reality is, if they can, if they can do it better at scale, then then chances are they'll unlock much more innovation. Um, which, yeah, Louis, I'd love to hear how you guys got going with with corporates and and how you managed to actually land some customers there. Because mostly startups I engage just so people ignore them. I think the big the biggest thing I would say any startup that is so I oh what I will say we we were very lucky in the sense that I'll. And sales cycles weren't very long. 
I think it's quite unique to the product we're selling. If I end up in a room with a CEO of a corporate, he is a reader. And there's a 95% chance that person is reading already. So to kind of sell that concept of getting your teams to read at a fraction of the cost that it, of any other corporate training is, it's, it, it's a very straightforward sell. It's also not a complicated product. So I do think it, it kind of varies from product to product. We don't have the traditional enterprise solution that they incredibly extensive onboarding and switching hearings and stuff like that. But finding the champion inside the corporate. And in our case, and we were very lucky that the champion is usually one of the executives um, because they are to make the decisions and are the readers. But you need to find, because you're not selling to a corporate, someone in that corporate is selling your product on behalf to the corporate. So you need to essentially just go find your salesman or saleswoman in that corporate. That is your goal. You're not really, you need to get someone in there or a group of people even better on your team. And they need to believe in your product to such an extent that they're willing to put their name on the line to sell it into the corporate. So you're almost creating sales groups and sales people inside corporates. And I think when that switch, when we realized it's not so much about booked selling to a corporate, it's about booked quote unquote recruiting salesmen from within the corporate to kind of push the product inside the company. We're just very lucky that they aligned to be the executives. The decision making, there was no lag. Um, the feedback loop was very, very short, instantaneous, basically. But nonetheless, it, it remains true because we haven't dealt with people other than the executives. So, bigger th uh, thing for me is just realize that it's not really you selling into the corporate. You need to enable and recruit kind of your salesmen from within the corporate. So, you should be able to give them the, the, the language. That is, my goodness, communication and what your product does in language. If someone at a bri can't explain what your product does within two minutes, you need to go understand the concept of time to value and fix that because it's just not going to spread. It's just not easy to sell a product. Um, so simplify your communication, get it down, get your time to value as close to zero as possible. And just understand you're, you need to enable people inside the corporate, just switch from us starting to corporate, us finding salespeople inside corporate. And I, I really do think that that'll make quite a big difference. Again, it's not across all products. I do understand there yeah. are nuances, but for our type of product, that mm. has worked really well. So, so, so Louis, practically, like, let's say I build a sales product, right? Um, let's say something similar kind of price range. And I go day one, cool. I need to go find a champion at F and B. Like, where do you start? How do you reach out? Or what have you learned works in, in, in that process of going from, okay, cool, let's look who could be a customer. Wow, this f and could be a great customer um, or enter, enter corporate name here. Um, what, do, what do you look for? Then when you find that person, how do you actually get them interested and engaging and having meetings and becoming your champion eventually? Autonomy and high energy. Those are the two leading indicators for me that the person you're dealing with is gonna, is gonna, you know, uh, take us, take us through. It's maybe to give a practical example. If we're working with someone like Old Mutual, something I'll go do is understand what type of books they want to read by literally just going and following all of the executives on whatever social channels that they spend time on. And you can literally go search from within and see how they posted on any book really recently. And so it's basically comes down to finding the people inside the company. It doesn't, for us, it doesn't need to be the L&D manager or the HR manager. It doesn't always need to be what people think is the point of sale. It's simply the person inside that organization who's close, not too far removed from a decision maker, who's extremely high energy. And you can see that through their, um, through kind of social media is basically if you go on LinkedIn, I'm selling books into a corporate on LinkedIn, Old Mutual, for example, I can literally on LinkedIn filter Old Mutual, search who's talking about reading, who, do they have book clubs, who is leading this book club, who's trying to drive these book clubs. I reach out to that person and start building a relationship. And it's not that, you know, it, it's really not a, uh, you need to kind of also give in that. And that's why I say it is a relationship because it is kind of the longer term journey you're working with that person because it's not a one-stop sale. I think a lot of companies kind of 
especially the ones that, you know, we don't sell on a yearly basis, but many companies sell for a year up front and then shifts. I'm off. Good luck using my software. Like it is, you're constantly selling. When renewal comes around, you best believe that that champion is still better be on your side. Mm -hmm. Oh, and who's batting for you inside the corporate? So, and mm -hmm. um, I would say it's finally that high energy and um, person inside the corporate who loves the types of products that you built, whether it is financial accounting system. There is someone talking about financial accounting systems, which kind of raving about the next new thing inside a big corporate. And it's just connecting with those individuals. It doesn't really matter whether, whether they're traditionally the buyer inside the organization, because through them, you can get to the, the right decision makers. I think people often think they found a decision maker. And while that person may can take a decision, it's just not the right person to speak to. Um, mm. So finding the individual champions who have autonomy inside the organization, who can actually help you navigate. Because an organization is incredibly complicated to navigate. It's very difficult to navigate. Mm. So you can't expect, especially me, I, don't, I never worked in corporate, so I had no experience, nor I really understood how they work. It, internally, the structure, obviously. So for me, finding someone that I could get on our side who understood how these corporates work and could help us navigate and act as essentially an extended or indirect employee of the company, uh, that's what you want to get. And you can usually find that person through socials just by, it takes time. It's a low grease. And that's why I think founders really just need to be comfortable with volume. Like at the end of the day, you know, work smarter, not harder, I suppose to an extent, but it, it's, you're not going to negate the fact that you're going to need to put in volume because volume kind of leads to information. So the more volume you put in searching inside all mutual, the more likely it is you'll find the right individuals to start a relationship with. And I would say, don't just do it as one. There's oftentimes multiple individuals inside a corporate. And again, volume. When you see one's not really coming to the table, you can kind of focus more on the others. So it's kind of volume initially and then scale back down, double down on the relationships that are working. So I'm curious to, to, to ask about your build of releasing this. You say a book is three years old. Am I correct? You said three earlier, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so well, when, a little bit more. But yeah. So, so when did when were you comfortable to start selling the product? So we talk about MVPs all the time, but I'm curious to know from what you just explained, when did you have that MSP, that minimal sellable product that you were comfortable to go into the old mutuals and, hey, I've bought this thing. Can you just tell us about that journey? Oh, geez. If you guys, as you see the first product that we sold into a company, I'm actually going to post it one day. I'm going to post it. I'm going to post a, a link to that GitHub repo. That's the one I program. So I don't really um, code day to day anymore. I have a lot yeah. of thoughts around founders needing to be technical. So I actually do what I get stuck back in. But nonetheless, I programmed the, the MVP that we sold our first corporate. If I could pull that up right now, you guys would not stop laughing for the rest of the podcast. It was like these canvas stock images as the background. It, it was, in hindsight, one of the worst creations. I I mean, like, I'm more than just embarrassed. It's actually, I'm going to post that GitHub repo at some point. But anyway, so, no, we naively probably didn't really try and justify that the thing needs to be, you know, reach X milestone. For us, it was just, is this thing working? Can we, you know, we need to move forward quickly. Is mm -hmm. it working? If it's working, we're going in. Um, and so, no, we sold into corporates very early on. The product, honestly, well, I really feel, I actually want to give that first corporate their money back. Like the product really was not, <laughs> it wasn't. And so no, we, we had no rules there. We just went straight in. Um, as soon as we had something resembled a functioning product, we started speaking to corporates. And I think at that stage, you must remember corporates also, especially if you find the right, and we were very lucky to find that champion straight up. So that helped us a lot. But like a big thing startups need to understand as well is corporates, corporates are not stupid. They understand that if they're working with small companies, it's what they get now is not what they're going to have in six months time. They're investing in the long-term idea behind the product and the long-term problem it can solve for the company. You know, our product didn't really acutely and effectively solve that corporate's problem at that point in time. But they understood that at some stage, it really will, you know, 
bring a big ROI, which it did. And they really did gain a lot of value from it eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't, you know, the right corporates and the right partners really do understand that, look, this is not just, this is a slightly longer term thing. We're jumping in bed with these guys and we're almost building the product with them. At the beginning, you are consultants to the corporate that you're giving you a product in hopes that the product delivers value to them. And you should iterate extremely quickly. So embarrassed about your first version because if you guys saw ours, you would, you would, you would laugh a lot. Jed, build something that works, speak to your champions inside of corporate and they'll understand in some way, shape or form that this is not, this is a longer term play and mm -hmm. that they, uh, they're kind of investing in your solution to their problem. Uh, and that's, and that's at least what, what mm -hmm. kind of what I learned through this process. I like it. Um, Rene, I'm going to, I'm going to start closing off. Um, do you have anything? Yeah, Louis, maybe just, um, San Francisco, how has it been as a South African? Should more people come? Why? They love South Africans. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. Like it's the easiest, if they hear the accent, the first question is, are you Australian? And then after I say no, and then, then I'm, then I'm allowed inside the inner circle. I don't know what Australia did San Francisco, but when they hear us, they don't Elon Musk, do they? <laughs> or a, or a rule of Bertha. Like everybody wants to get in the good books of Elon and the rule of Bertha. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, yeah rule of is a, is a, is a, is a big one. Yeah. But it's actually a lot, you know, someone like, yeah, we actually have a lot of incredible founders here that people just don't know about. But anyway, no, as a South African has been an incredible experience in San Francisco, these guys, they really do work hard here. Yeah. And I think that's for me, it was really good to see that they, they put in the volume. They really put in the volume. They work really hard and it is extremely competitive, which is very important for a startup to be exposed to that because at the end of the day, it's the best solution is going to work. And if you're not competing against the very best, you're just not going to win at scale. And so for me, it was very, 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 very important to get you and just be hit in the face with, oh, geez, there's an ecosystem that is just it, it, yeah, it's so, so big and the people are so good here. So that for me was brilliant to see. And that's why I say, I think a big investment for startup founders in South Africa is, I don't know what your plane tickets will cost, spend your 30 to 50,000, you just raise a small round, try and spend 30 to 50,000, come live in San Francisco for a month. You know, you, you can find cheapish accommodation. There's just so much to do and you'll learn. The amount you're learning that month is going to put your startup in here. Um, I don't even argue yours again, and I would do want to emphasize this. What works here is not necessarily going to work in South Africa. So I, I'm not saying we need to copy San Francisco, but I'm saying we do need to learn from San Francisco because then the reason this place is just pumping out unicorns left, right, and center, they are building really good technology. Um, so no, I'd say please, as an African founder, if, if you are in a position to do so, Try and uh, earmark some of your investment money or speak to your investors or whatever. Just try and get in San Francisco for a little while. Just experience it. Uh, I come to San Francisco city, not Silicon, not the South Bay, not Silicon Valley. Uh, city is the way it's at. It matters. Uh, yeah. Oh, you don't want to be on a train for an hour every day. All the yeah. events, I mean, they have probably six events at night where we have maybe six events a year. So yeah. it's just a kind of like, put it in perspective, like there's a lot of movement. And I think a lot of founders should just be exposed to that at least. Mm. So, so Louis, um, uh, if you, I mean, obviously you follow the podcast, uh, but we finish every episode with the lightning round and because we pressed for time, we won't do the whole lightning round. But what I am going to ask you is if you were to take part in the lightning round, my first question is always what book recommendation my guest has. You've got a booked company that talks about all these books. I've got... I've got 70 episodes, let's say, of book recommendations. How can we partner up? What can we do? I've got all these recommendations. What should I do with it? Everyone, all, I think most founders have given us a different book. It's very seldom they tell us the same book to read. That's actually quite interesting. I, I would have thought a lot of them would, would hit the standard zero to one and lean start, and that's that. Um, I mean, so those I'm, two have come up and, and they, they have overlapped once or twice, but for the most part, we get different ones. So interestingly enough, mine is not a book recommendation. Um, can you believe it? Running a book company doesn't recommend a book. It's, um, I, I wouldn't even say this is necessarily a shameless plug, but 
what we've actually done, and this is just to make it easier for entrepreneurs, is we've taken all of Paul Graham's best essays on building and growing startups because he's had a hand in creating billions of dollars of value, Stripe, Airbnb, Dropbox. Um, it's just ridiculous. And Y Combinator is correcting them. And Y Combinator is the machine of note. It, it, it's incredible to see that process. But anyway, a large part of Y Combinator's kind of curriculum is based around Paul Grant's essays. So we've kind of collated his best essays, I think it's about 20, into a, and, and it's about a book length. Um, that a lot of the entrepreneurs we work with now kind of read that on book. But honestly, if you're an entrepreneur or founder or want to be a founder, just start there because it's so, because it's broken up into essays, there's no plus. Every essay is just straight to the point as value. And it's just a compilation of just pure value. And do you, whether you read some books or not, please just read his essays. He yeah. has written some really good things, gives some really simple practical advice in terms of how to think about how oh. quickly many startups think I'm going to create these goals for growth. Like, how on earth do you know how many users you're going to get in a month? Like, you're an early stage startup. That's a ridiculous notion. Whereas he just dials it back and says, just aim to grow 10% a week. Just all things like that. Like, it's just really good ways to structure your thinking in terms of how you set up your company and, mm. um, you know, just kind of how to execute. Because at the end of the day, you just need to grow. You mm. need to do whatever is in front of you just to grow that company. Uh, that's it. Usually, if a company's growing, everything else kind of tends to sort itself out. You don't really have to worry too much about investors and all of these things. But you need to grow. So you need to build the product people actually want to use. And then you'll be surprised how quickly other things just seem to fall in place. Um, so that's my recommendations. Paul Graham's essays. Brilliant. Before Renia's wife hunts me down, uh, we're going to have to call it a day. <laughs> but Louis, it's uh, really great to hear your story. I'm, I'm really excited to see your San Francisco journey, what you bring up. Thanks to a previous guest who recommended we reach out to you and, and, and get you on the podcast. So I'm really stoked that we did because I think it's a really cool thing as a reader. And I mean, that's... Uh, you were mentioning, you know, you've already got the readers. How do we get other readers? But as a reader, I think it's such a phenomenal concept and I'm really excited to hear about it. So thank you very much for sharing your journey and we look forward to to watching. Um, yeah, Renia. Yeah, yeah, thanks, 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 Louis. Scott. And uh, we, we need to get a book, book club up for our open letter community. Exactly. So chat about we'll chat afterwards. Give me the book name. We'll sort it out for you. I love nice. it. Love it. I'm in on this one. Okay, guys. Thanks very much. Eh? Thanks, Scott. Thanks, right. Thanks, Bobby. Appreciate it.